A little jewel among the many urban treasures in the city of Edina is the Edina Art Center. Located in a leafy city park and natural wetland area, the Art Center offers a variety of classes and events unrivaled in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. From its origin in a small country house, the Art Center has grown to include three painting studios, three pottery areas, two additional classrooms, and a completely equipped media services center. My name is Colin Nelson, and the, I'm a writer myself. My <laughs> most recent book is called Fallout. It is a uh, suspense book, that, or novel, that takes place here in Minnesota. Terrorists are attempting to blow up a nuclear power plant in Monticello. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We are so happy to have Jonathan O'Dell here to brighten up the day. We'll get to that in just a minute. I want to welcome you all to the Dinah Arts Center and the Author Studio. My name is Colin Nelson. I'm on the Dinah Art Center board. And on behalf of the board, welcome you to the Art Center here. If you get a chance, take a look around this beautiful facility that is packed with wonderful art. Also, we have a gift shop uh, right around the corner to your right. You probably came through that. We all try to buy local. Well, this is a good way to buy local from local artists. Uh, I bought my wife's earrings for Christmas in there. I was very popular at home. <laughs> and of course, uh, I'm a writer myself. John's and my books are available out there afterward. Uh, John, <laughs> my uh, most recent book is called Fallout. It is a uh, suspense book, that, or novel, that takes place here in Minnesota. Terrorists are attempting to blow up a nuclear power plant in Monticello. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> you can go now. <laughs> glad I could, glad I could support you. I got that. The, I got that. The silent Ooh. wind beneath his wings. <laughs> One other thing, for those of you that are new uh, to the author studio, uh, I don't recognize some faces, so thank you for coming. If you would like, would you please put your uh, email address and we will keep in touch with you about future programs. We meet, thanks Barbara, we meet here the second Saturday of every month. We'll take June and July, August off, but otherwise we are here the second Saturday of every month at 10 o'clock. Next month, Bonnie Blodgett will be our guest. She is a uh, columnist for the Star Tribune. But she's written a, a book on gardening, which will be perfect in April. And then in May, Joel Carter, who uh, his sculpture won third place, I believe, in the Edina Public Art. And it's on display uh, over by Cornelia uh, Park. He'll be our guest, and he's he'll talk about sculpting and healing. You may want to come to that. It's called the healing. Yeah. And it's down on the promenade. On the promenade. Thank you for reminding me. His sculpture is called The Healing. Yeah. And it's on the uh, promenade at Cornelia Park. It's... So um, the program lasts about an hour. We'll leave time for <laughs> questioning. And I will now introduce our guest, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan's book, his most recent book, The Healing, uh, the Star Tribune called this one of the five best books in 2012. I've read it. It is one of the five best books I've read in a long time, not only 2012. John also, uh, this book is a finalist in the Minnesota Book Awards in the fiction category. So we are very, very happy to have John with us today. Thank you. John, before we talk about the book itself, we'll get into that in one minute, I'd like you to tell us, you, you told me once there was a PBS program that you saw many years ago that changed your life and motivated you to write. Yeah, um, happy you remembered that. It was, um, as you may or may not know, I grew up in Mississippi and lived there until I was 29 years old. 
and escaped at that age <laughs> when, the, when the border guards weren't looking and uh, made it to Minnesota. And uh, <clears throat> it was here. I don't think you understand home until you leave it. And you don't understand who you are until you are a minority. And then you go, oh, not everybody thinks this way, and not everybody does this. And um, after six years, I was, per it was, I knew that I was a racist. I knew that my parents were racist. I knew that I grew up in a racist land. I knew my preacher was a racist, and all the, my closest friends were racist. And I rejected that and turned my back on all those people in my entire state and said I was different than that. So I became a liberal racist. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, I moved from the position of hating and, and uh, black folks to feeling sorry for black folks, as a good Minnesotan would do, all those poor folks. Um, and then I voted Democratic, so I thought I was pretty well healed. <laughs> and um, it was in 1988, it was the 20th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. And here in, here in Minnesota, as in everywhere else in the country, on these on these significant dates, they go back in history and do right. uh, retro looks at uh, what was going on. And one of the things they were doing that evening on PBS, they were showing old film clips of the Civil Rights Days, and particularly of Dr. King and Ralph Abernathy and Stokely Car Carmichael. They were marching down these Mississippi main streets with a throng of African Americans. And I'd seen this when I was growing up on Huntley Brinkley and on Walter Cronkite, and my folks always said, oh, that has nothing to do with us. That's just those people. That's not our colored people doing that. It's outsiders. And so and that's the way I grew up. I grew up as blacks being the background of my life. I was talk about in the note to the reader in the back of my book about how I was trained, not in phys physical segregation, because in Mississippi, it's impossible to physically segregate the races. We're half and half, and most of the towns are half black and half white. So we're like this in each other's lives. So white folks were taught systematically not to see black folks as individuals. We saw them as a class. We saw them as functionaries, as maids, as yard men, as that other group of people, but not as individuals. In fact, I was thinking the other day, one of the, the way, I was wondering, how do you enforce that? Because these are really good Southerners are the most Christian people in the world, most church-going people in the world. So how do you enforce something like Jim Crow, which, which it, it put down and silence an entire race of people? How do you keep that going? And I remembered one of the ways was eye contact. When I was growing up, everybody knew that a black person was not supposed to look at a white person in the eye. Mm. It was considered aff affrontive or a pushy or uh, not knowing their place. And people could get in a lot of trouble, especially black men. So, um, and I always thought, okay, that's just a per perverted form of white power. And it wasn't until I started looking at my, my own psychology that I realized you cannot look at another person in the eye and see the other. All of a sudden they become a person, they become an uncle, they become an aunt, they become a father, they become a church leader, they become human. And with eye contact would have broken down Jim Crow. Mm. You cannot do that to another group of people who you consider humans. You have to other them in some way. So it's eye contact. So even though I was uh, supposedly a liberal in Minnesota, I, but they, they were still the background of my life. And it's easy to do here. This is an easy place to be a racist because everybody's so nice. So I was doing, I was still, still telling racist jokes and getting promotions and my bosses were just kind of nodding their head and talking about how incorrigible I was and that was kind of cute young guy. But nobody ever said, that's offensive. So uh, I was pretty happy with myself. And then that evening, the, those films came on and the first thing you want to do when you hear about civil rights oftentimes is you go, oh, history lesson, and you put your, your left brain on, you're going to be preached at and talked to and made you feel guilty. And, uh, but for the first time, it hit me differently on those grainy films. I didn't look so much at the marchers, but I looked at the people on the side of the street, the white people who were throwing the rocks and waving the Confederate flags and yelling the epithets. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like, oh my God, 
this is not black history, this is my history. And it's those people who are marching and those people on the side who created who I am. And I don't know a damn thing about who I am. And I just understood my entire identity of being a white male in this country was based on fallacy, was based on the silence of an entire, it's like their silence subsidized my feeling of superiority. And immediately I knew why I had gotten ahead, ahead, ahead in life, is my privilege became so clear. It wasn't because I was so good looking and so smart. I was white and I knew how to use it. Um, I don't know if you've ever had transformational moments in your life. I've had a few of them. And it's, it's those moments when it's usually not lightning from heaven or a big miraculous event of somebody walking on water. It's usually you see something that's always been there, but you see it in a different way. Right. And because you see it in a different way, it reorganizes your entire past. You go, oh, that's what that was about. And that's what happened. It reorganized my entire family history, it, my, my entire social history, the entire history they teach in the South about slavery and civil war and who I was, and I was left with nothing. I mean, the timbers fell out beneath my identity, and I didn't know what to do. I mean, I started crying. It was that huge. And all f I started remembering faces, African Americans, who I, had, had, I was close to when I was a kid, but when the, it came time for the veil to drop, they became the other. There's a, uh, a, the a theologian, Doug Horton, says, if, if conscience is our window, then evil is the curtain. And that's what happened. A curtain fell between me. And that night, the curtain raised again, and I saw eye to eye. And um, that started the journey. Uh, I can talk another hour about that if you like. But We will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a bathroom break. Um, this is John's second book. His first book, you do write about your, in a veiled way, your life growing up there. But the healing... My mother doesn't think it's so veiled. <laughs> <laughs> I named the kid Johnny just so she wouldn't miss the point. <laughs> For those of you that have not read The Healing, it is a remarkable book because, amongst many reasons, here we have a white middle-aged person who writes about black slaves in the mid-1800s. So for those that have not read the book, can you tell, tell them what the book's about? Yeah, um, the book mostly takes place in the year 1860, which is a year before the Civil War. Um, abolition is uh, fiercely running its course in the North. The South is feeling more and more uh, under fire for its way of life. And there's a defensiveness that's going on through the land. And there's a plantation, the Satterfield Plantation, run by a very smart white man who scientifically builds his plantation. I didn't understand that plantations were factories, and the most successful plantation owners were the best factory. They ran their factories based on weights and scales and, and uh, the best science of the day for breeding, for get, to, to getting the girls to menstruate at the earliest age. And it was all done cold and clinically. And he realized that abolitionists were changing the nature of, of the way that slaves were thinking. There were free slaves roaming, roaming, roaming around the country, and that to him was a danger. So he set up a plantation in the middle of the Mississippi Delta, which at that time was millions and millions and millions of acre of flooding swamp. So he built irrigation systems and, and dried out 3,000 acres and built his plantation. And he figured he could raise his own slaves and never have to go buy another slave. And he could, he could train them how to think about themselves and about servitude and not have anybody interfering with that. And they would never have to see a freed black person. Well, it was quite isolated, too. Where, the, the plantation in your book, The right? plantation in the book, it actually takes, the, the county is Hopalachia County, which is uh, actually, if you want to look it up on the map, it's, it's a combination of LaFleur and Carroll counties. It was the last to be uh, cleared in the 1890s after they built the levees on the Mississippi River to keep it from flooding. And um, it's also close to something they call Parchman Prison. Have you ever heard of Parchman Prison? That's a notorious prison in Mississippi. It's 30,000 acres of farmland. And so pr prisoners were sent to cultivate crops there. And they didn't have any fences. They didn't need them. You cannot <laughs> escape from it because it's surrounded by swamp and alligators. People get lost and die. So people would stay, and that's, that was his idea. Um, there's also, uh, in those days, there were white doctors 
for slaves. They're more like veterinarians. They treated the slaves like cattle. And their three goals were, one, to uh, help the slaves be more fertile because money was in birthing more slaves, help them stand up longer in the field, so for endurance, and also to look good for resale. Those were the three goals. And usually they could fix some of the diseases, but there was one disease that was running rampant th through the master slaves. It's called black tongue. It's an actual disease. And they didn't know what was causing it, but it was killing the slaves. And the white doctors were killing more slaves with their remedies. So he decides, the slave, on the slave owner, Mr. Satterfield, decides to break his own rule and buys off the plantation. And he buys a, 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 rep a, uh, a, a slave with a reputation for a healer up north in North Carolina. Her name is Polly Shine. He brings her, she's an elderly woman, and her job is to heal the slaves with her own remedies, which are all scientifically, she's not magical, she's just extremely wise. And, um, which works fine until the master says, you're over 80, and I paid $5,000 for you, which is exorbitant for slaves. Good, good field hand was $1,200. So you better not die with all this stuff in your head. <laughs> So you pick an apprentice and make sure that she knows what you know before you die. Otherwise, I'm going to throw you in a ditch like a dog with no grieving out ceremony, which was big among the black community. You had to be grieved out into heaven. So she picks the most unlikely of sources. She sees the site in a house girl named Granada. Granada is 13 years old, and her history is the night the mistress's own daughter died of cholera, the mistress went crazy, went out to the uh, slave quarters and plucked up a young birth, a just birthed black girl, as black as coal, which is different than the other house girls who are really white. And she raised this as a girl kind of like her own, more like an ornament, more like a psychologist. When, when, when a mother loses a baby, they'll give them some kind of transference object, like a teddy bear or something to hold. So you, and that's what she became. For 13 years, she was raised as an ornamental child. So it was the only mother she had, and the children don't, aren't choosy. They will take whatever mothering they can get, and they will try to make it work. And so when Polly said, I want this girl to come work with me in the hospital and tend to these field slaves who the little girl did not want to touch because they were dirty and they were dark and they were the worst of the worst, she rebelled. But Polly persists. So the entire book is about a domestic struggle between a girl who doesn't know who she is, where she belongs, who her mother is, who her people are, and this woman named Polly Shine, who even though, even though is a slave, has never lost the understanding and the idea of freedom. How, how did you do the research for that? Uh, it was easy. Uh, it's, it's it started phenomenal. in 1988. <laughs> it was... Uh, I'd rather research than write. I mean, somebody said, I heard a writer say, I love writing, it's just the paperwork I hate. <laughs> and that's true for me. I mean, the, 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 it started to fill in those blanks, realizing that I was created in the space between black people and white people. That race is created, but there's no such thing as race. Race is a construct between us. We, we do it. And so I wanted to learn all those pieces. And the way that I did that, I went down south and I just interviewed black folks. And not to save them and not to do an anthropological study, but to say, look, I'm broken. And I think your stories created my stories, but you've been silent and you've been silenced. You're not in my history books. My parents didn't talk about you. But I think it's your wisdom and your creations and your brilliance and your music and your food and your science and your architecture. Made, I was, Southerners are born in the black cradle. And I said, hmm. can you tell me stories to heal me? And when they knew that it was about healing me and not about voyeurism or some kind of uh, liberal racism to make me feel good about who I am, they pulled out their picture boxes. Wow. They pulled out their family trees. They showed me freedom papers from the 1860s. And they didn't show me, just hmm. tell me all the stuff to make me feel bad as a white man, which is usually what, because black people know that we don't listen very closely. So they had to say, this is what you've done to me. And then we even get more defensive. <laughs> they just opened up and told me their stories, warts and all, about unwanted rapes from white people, how they couldn't keep their women safe, kids who are all different colors because of all the different colors of white men that were around, uh, home remedies, uh, people they loved. Um, and those voices became the first book, actually. 
and that led me to a, a set of books. If you haven't, if you want to read American poetry at its best, go find the WPA narratives. They're, 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 uh, they were done in the 1930s. It was a WPA program from the Depression era, and white artists, white writers out of work were given money to go interview ex-slaves, surviving slaves in the 1930s, and they did it in their own vernacular. It's the most beautiful language I've ever heard because it's full of mm -hmm. metaphor, and it's full of uh, a simile, and it's full of uh, an uh, an analogy because they had to talk in riddles so the white people wouldn't understand what they were saying, and that's poetry. So they told their own lives, so that came out of it. And then how, how with the midwives, how I many interview, down. How many interviews I did you think count. you did? Hundreds. And I've Hundreds? Ta taped a lot of them so I can go back and listen to those voices of the people who were passed, because a lot of them were, real, uh, were elderly. Tell us about uh, your interview with uh, Miss Willa. Ms. Willie. Ms. Ms. Willie. Willie, yeah, my favorite. <laughs> uh, when I was ready to write the book, I had done all the research. I'd done the, the studying of the AMA journals in the 1930s when they tried to vilify the midwife because she was in the, in the 1930s and 40s, m public money started pouring into the counties again to service poor people. So white doctors who did not want to touch black flesh up until that time now realized it was profitable. So the white medical establishment in the 1930s made a push into the poor areas. But the thing is, they couldn't get past the midwives. All the trust in the black women were in the midwives. I just worked with John Hopkins yesterday and uh, working with the doctors there on trying to cement a relationship. Have you ever re read the book, Roberta, uh, he, the, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks? Yes. Yes. And in, uh, it, do, do you remember the distrust between the black folks and the medical? That's, that's all over the country. In Mississippi, black, white doctors in this, all along, up until the late 60s, could give any black woman that came to them, uh, they could sterilize them without even telling them. All they had to do is judge them incompetent or judge them as uh, prolific breeders or a burden on the welfare, and they could do it. So, and then there's the Tuskegee studies. The trust between black folks and, and white doctors still exists. And the public health says that blacks always feel a stranger there. They feel estranged. So, um, but these, so these midwives were pushed out. They were vilified in the medical journals. And then in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, legislatures started licensing them as a way to get rid of the old granny doctor. And one of the licensures stated they had to be able to read it. Most of these women were illiterate. So it was just like, so by the 1960s, they were all gone and sitting around. And I needed to talk to one. And so I called a, an informant that I had that I interviewed on, on the first book, Tommy Tucker, who had a plantation in Mississippi. And I called a white man and I said, I need to find a, um, a midwife to talk to. I've got the information, but I need a voice. I need somebody, and I want this person to be feisty. I don't want her to pull any punches. I don't want her to treat me like a white man. And I don't want her to be de deferential. He says, oh, who do I have the woman for you? <laughs> he says, you may, be, you may regret it. If she deigns to talk to you. And I said, it's Ms. Willie Turner. She's 92 years old, and she lives in Midnight, Mississippi. <laughs> and um, he said, here's a telephone number. But he says, I wouldn't advise calling her on the phone. I said, why? He said, well, she's half deaf, but she's prideful. <laughs> So you'll talk to her and she'll pretend like she can hear and you'll have the strangest conversation ever. She said, but here's the number of her daughter. Her daughter got good hearing because she's only 70 years old. So call her daughter. If they want to talk to you, the daughter, well, then we'll make arrangements with the mother. And they'll, they'll, so I called the daughter and I said, I need to talk to your, your mom, Ms. Willie, about a midwife. And you think she'll talk to me? And she says, when can you get there? I, I was not expecting that kind of reception. And I said, well, I, I'm in town now. She was in Belzoni at that time. And I said, I'm in town now. I can meet her anytime. She said, how about tomorrow? Because she'll want to get her hair done. I said, okay. <laughs> so I met her the next day, and this woman walked in. I walked into her apartment where she'd been living. This elegant, maybe five, four, eleven, five foot tall woman come up, just erect. Erect this posture as a school teacher, you know, she just comes up and she meets me and she, she, she says, it's nice to meet you, Mr. Odell, welcome to my home. <laughs> and that's when I knew what I was going to be writing about because she didn't talk to me like I was, she wasn't subservient and it wasn't this southern hospitality that was going on. Have you ever met those rare people for the first time, but you meet them and they look into you and you feel known? Mm -hmm. you, some people have that quality. 
and you feel accepted and you feel like I can trust I can tell this person anything I just I don't, it may be crazy but I can hmm. she looked into me and I just I felt known I, I the best feeling I can say is she blessed me just by being there she her hair was just still warm from the beauty parlor she had this brand new yellow dress on <laughs> elegant she escorted me over to where we were going to be sitting and the pad and paper was ready for me to write down my questions <laughs> and uh, so we had this three-hour conversation and uh, it was the most amazing conversation I think I've had in my life because um, I had to write the questions down and I am uh, you cannot read my writing so I was pushing that over there and she was she's almost illiterate so she was in so what you want to know and I said yes ma'am what I want to know is and then the daughter who's 70 with good hearing said mama what he's saying is so for three hours we were just yelling at each other and laughing and this woman had the most wicked sense of humor you know somebody is born to do what they're doing because it's not their profession it's who they are because of their humor <clears throat> the humor is hilarious and it's insightful but it's and it's funny and it's wicked but it's never bitter it's never sarcastic or edgy like I asked her I said if how many have read the book in the book how many have not read the book <laughs> okay and how many have not bought the book yet <laughs> no, <there we> go. <laughs> you're my audience by the way we've got some, how many people only have one book okay but so um, what was I saying? It wasn't interesting. Miss Willie. Oh, Miss Willie. Well, she was, uh, I, I said, in the book, I want to have a scene where the, the woman, the mother, fights the midwife. Doesn't want to have the baby. Fights the midwife. That's the Rubina scene. I said, did that ever happen to you? She says, did a woman fight me? She said, yeah, did anybody ever fight you? She says, fight me. I had one. Bite me. <laughs> and I said, bite you? I said, what'd you do? She says, I slapped that woman in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and she says, and that baby went whoop. <laughs> and the thing is, I don't know if that actually happened or not. In the South, they have a saying, all stories are true and some even happen. <laughs> and I think what she was telling me was, was who she was as a midwife. She's walking into the shack. There's no anesthetic. There's no forceps. There's no doctor nearby. She's on a mule. If anything happens, where is she going to go? There's no probably, there's very little food. It's probably not very clean. And so everything depends on this woman trusting Ms. Willie. And what she wants, she's got to take charge, and she's got to say, if between you and me and Jesus now, honey, you turn it over to me. I got you. I got you. And it, wasn't, it was not a sentimental thing at all, which mm. destroyed my whole idea about birthing as a sentimental thing. It's a fierce act. And that's what I understood about midwifing, why the midwives had higher live birth rates than the doctors who replaced them. Can you believe that? That struck me as crazy because I'm a believer in medical science and I hate superstition, especially when it kills kids. But when I go to the hospital, think about it, the doctor knows me as my room number or he knows me as the appendectomy or knows me, Ms. Willie knows you. And that's the person I want to, I think there's a spiritual act in healing. The doctor doesn't just do things to us. We give something over to the doctor. We give the doctor permission. Mm -hmm. To, to, to go to those places and what that's what she did she gave permission what, what kind of train do you know what kind of training miss Willie had yes if by, by the way before I forget her book this interview luckily I taped it and Random House loved it so it's on the audio version of the book wow. her, and also I've got it on my website you can listen to it for free my website is John Odell what is what is Jonathan Odell dot com Jonathan Odell dot com and it's an interview with Miss Willie Turner you can hear it in um, you can also see her picture. But her training, in first thing she says is, I always wanted to be a nurse, but I didn't have no education to be a nurse. Now my mama, she was a midwife. And then she talks about following her mama around when she was 12 years old and the miracle of birth. <laughs> and this is a 92-year-old woman, thousands of births, and every once in a while she'd stop the interview and talk about birthing some technical thing, and she'd look out the window and she'd look at me and she said, ain't that a miracle? <laughs> Ain't that a miracle? And as I was talking, I said, you, it's really still close to you, isn't it, midwife? And they ran her out because she didn't have what she needed for the doctor's sake. She says, she says oh, she was calling me honey by then, which is great in the South. Everybody calls you honey. She says, well, honey, she says, yeah, every night I'm in the delivery room. I dream mm. about it every night. She said, I'm delivering babies. She said, these hands, they don't never forget what to do. Mm. And the arthritic fingers, she said, these hands, they don't never forget what to do. You know, 
started how me many, crying. So she learned by, by apprenticing, like, like Granada did in the book. Yeah. How many, how many <clears throat> children did she birth? It should, uh, there's never any short answer to, to anything you ask me. So it always <laughs> leads okay. to another story. Uh, but at the end, when I realized they were so anxious to talk to me, that she wanted to get this story down. That she wanted somebody to redeem not only her, but her sister midwives, who had been so scandalized. And so it was very important that I got the information. So a 92-year-old woman sitting there for three hours was a huge effort, especially not being able to hear. And um, so at the end, I just want to make sure I got it right. And I said, Ms. Willie, before, before we leave, I said, just tell me in your own words, as if she would deign to use anybody else's. <laughs> I said, uh, what, what did it mean to you to be a midwife? And she thought for a minute, because she knew this was important. This was going to be the theme of the book. And she looked out the window, and she looked back at me, and she says, honey, she says, in Humphreys County alone, I caught 2,063 children. Wow. And she says, and every one of them calls me mother. Hmm. And I said, oh, that's it. She said, no, 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 it's not it. She said, you see, every one of them is still my child. And that was Ms. Willie. And um, wow. it became a sacred, it was sacred ground at that point. This was, I knew, you know, I'm a gay guy. And going into birthing rooms was not top of my priority list. <laughs> and I thought, well, I, well, I've escaped that doom of having to do all the woman stuff. And, uh, and yet when she said that, I realized this was not about birthing. This is where birthing has been compartmentalized in our society as a medical procedure. This is about all of us. This is about a sacred, uh, the fierce cycle of survival and life and connection, the web of community, and it's female-centered, and it courses through us like rivers course through the land. And that's what she was telling me. This is not about midwifing. This is about midwife and community that big. So she wonderful. died in 2008, two years before the book came out. That's wonderful. You preserved that interview. That's yes, wonderful. and that was the first thing I wanted to do in 2010 when Random House wanted to buy the book. I called her up because I'd listened to her interview for inspiration. She is the voice of Polly Shine. That is Polly Shine. Her wicked humor, her competence, her, her not suffering fools lightly, you know, that's her. And um, so I called her up and the phone was disconnected. So I tried to call her daughter and I realized that wasn't her blood daughter. That was one of the 2,000 kids that she had birthed. So I couldn't track her down. I did a Google search and thank God, two years before she died, the Mississippi State Legislature had unanimously voted to commemorate her life for catching 2,063 babies in Humphreys County alone. The reason why she said that, half her career she spent in Holmes County, but the courthouse was burned down in Holmes County with all the records. So she'd never estimate how many babies, because she's a Christian woman, she tells the truth. So it's always Humphreys County alone, 2,063 babies. So she did get her recognition. So. Once you had done your, there's some water if you'd like, either one. Once you had done extensive research, how long did it take you to write Finish writing the book. Um, this book is what's left of a 900 page book. <laughs> wow. And uh, I had some problems. I, it, was, uh, it was a time sequence I was having the problems with. I'm not a great structure. Every writer has their own Achilles heels and mine is structure because I'm a first kid. I write everything linearly. I think chronologically. So at first I wrote the book. It started place. It started where this book ended. Hmm. And uh, so it started with Violet coming to Grand Grand's house. And then it went forward in the future. The book was actually about raising Violet into the 1930s and 40s and 50s when she became a midwife. And it was really boring. And I kind of knew that. And look, my husband, who's great, he's, a, he's an artist, but also he's a theater major and has worked on stage and done productions. So if you're a writer, have a best friend who knows theater because they, they don't have any tolerance for excess. It's a story that counts, not how much you know. Because I'd done so much research, I wanted you to know that. Yeah. <laughs> so I talked about how the, you know, the whole geograph geography of the land, the geology, the history, the Indian nature. It was like all the, so he was reading through it. He says, a, a James Mishner book. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> except not interesting. And so, <laughs> so, so uh, my... Uh, Jim said, um, 
you write really well, which I knew was... <laughs> But. He said, but, uh, you know, there's, uh, I'm not seeing the energy in it. He said, but there's one paragraph. There's one paragraph where you seem to show up. You seem to get excited. Where the rest of it, it just feels like you're just telling what you've learned. I said, what paragraph? Great. <laughs> one paragraph. At least we got to start. He said, it's toward the beginning. And he says, it's when the little girl is asking the old woman, where did you learn to do this? And you say, in the, and, and Grand Grand says, oh, back on the slave plantation. I was raised by an old healer named Polly Shine, and she took me to the woods and showed me how to name stuff. And that's all I wrote, because I'd read the name Polly Shine, I loved it, and I wanted to stick it in the book. He says, that's your story. I can I just feel it. Mm. Mm -hmm. wow. The good news is, yeah, he was right. The bad news is, that was like one paragraph out of 300 pages. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like two or three years to get to that far. So then I backed up the story, and I started with Polly Shine coming onto the plantation. And as soon as she hit the plantation, it was like, oh my God, this is the story. It's not, this is Polly Shine's the energy that's going to drive the book. So um, that was another couple of years doing that. Mm -hmm. And then I, at the end, I had the book. All the material that you read now was in the book, but it was linear. It was started in, with the death of the little white girl in 1840, maybe. And then it went through to... Granada coming into the big house, and it went progressed, slogged that way, all the way to 1933 with Violet coming in, and the whole story about Violet that's in the book. And it was deadly. I sent it out to, I lost an agent over this. She could not sell it. Because if you think about it, it was like a history lesson. There's no hope in it because you see what's coming. Things ain't getting better. And nobody wants to sit through a 300-page book to feel depressed at the end of it, you know. So I have this wonderful friend, Michelle Harris. She writes under the name C.M. Harris. And um, I, she's great at structure. She's my friend. I have friends who cover my weaknesses. And she read the book, and she said, you know, this is not a history book. This is not even about, about community. This book is about story. He said, you said... She said, and it's about how story heals. So why don't you be true to the theme and write the book as a story? Have the old woman telling this as a story. And we can see the healing take place. It was like, as soon as she said it, I knew it. That was exactly right. And, it, it, and people say, oh, you mad. You had to rewrite your entire book? No, it took a weekend. It was amazing. Wow. I took it, the last 50 pages wow. broke up in four or five sections perfectly. So they just became little wedges or little inserts between the history and the plantation. Because Polly Shine was the energy. As soon as I lost Polly Shine, the book died. So, I could, so I, the healing took place at three levels. Not only it, Grand Grand is healing by telling the story to Violet. Mm -hmm. Violet is healing by hearing the story and remembering the story from her mother. And another healing takes place by putting Grand Grand in her old age and Granada, in her young days, close together in the book, they start working with each other to build this sense of hope going toward the future. And then the next healing was healing of the author, because I was being healed by writing it. And hopefully the healing then transfers to the reader. So the only name could be the healing, as ambigu yes. ambiguous as that was. Yes. We're going to take some questions in just a minute. But one of the things that impresses me, John, about you is not only have you written a wonderful book, but you have taken this story and you're using it in the community, aren't you? For instance, That's there's been, a, you told me about a, uh, something called the Birthing Project. Yeah. What's great tell, about tell this us book, about that. I didn't know what a doula was until I published the book. And then I started getting call from doulas. There's an organization of doulas here. And uh, Judith Nylander um, had a book group of 90 doulas reading my book. And then she wrote me and said they were so they loved the book so much that they are reading passages of the book to birthing mothers. While mothers are here, I was not wanting to go to a birthing room, <laughs> and people are reading this guy, you know, this white guy's stuff to <laughs> mothers as they birth. And it was God. So I said, I got to talk to you. Let me come talk to some doulas. And then midwives started calling. And 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 so the book is finding its place into corners of healing that I had not anticipated. Um, the, gr the gratifying thing is when publishers want to buy your book, they want to know that it's going to sell to 98% of the fiction reading public, which are you, which are white women. So it's got to sell there. 
But what's happening is it's selling in all these niches mm -hmm. who the book is actually dedicated to <laughs> these, these black women who don't have, have their own historians. So I got a call from uh, Al McFarlane and Clarence Jones who have the uh, K, uh, K Campbell J radio station. And they said, there's a woman that you need to meet. And uh, they, they're reading your book and they can't believe the synchronicity about what they're doing. And I said, really? She said, yeah. So I went to meet this woman. Her name is Catherine Hall Trujillo. Trujillo. So, Trujillo. It's H-A-L-L-T-R-U-J-I-L-L-O. -L 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 you can Google her because she's well known. She was one of the CNN's heroes. She, her history was, she was an African American. She was a, um, a public health nurse in California and then she was put in charge of statistics. And in front of her, she kept seeing these mortality rates for black kids and Hispanic kids and underprivileged, and it just made her soul hurt. And she said, this is not what I got into public health service to do. She was called, as midwives often say they are, to do God's work, and that was to go to the community and do healing, her own communities. And the only paradigm she knew was her grandmother, who was a mid southern midwife. Mm. And so she, she goes across, around the world now. She's been to Cuba and in Eastern Europe, but also in every city. She's starting one here. She starts what she calls birthing projects. She goes into the community, and she trains women in how to be what she calls sister mothers. Because one of the biggest mm. problems is a lot of these young women are having their children out of wedlock, estranged from their families, with no wise women around to help them in the community. And plus, black women are strange anyway to the public health services. It's scary for them to go there alone. So she creates a web of community around these birthing mothers of love and support and helps them like the old midwives did to make sure there's food in the house and there's clothes for the kids, those simple basic things that mean everything and to be able to translate what the doctor's telling them into their own language, help them navigate these sophisticated uh, paper trails to get them to the doctors, get them to the pharmaceutical companies. It's, this all, it's amazing what it takes to have a kid if you're doing it by yourself. So uh, she started that. So I got a chance to come meet her, and I just fell in love with her. So oftentimes, I don't do a lot of book groups, but when I do, is the Southern woman here from the book group? I don't know if you came. Anyway, I'm doing a book group this afternoon of 20 misplaced Southerners in Minnesota. <laughs> and so that's going to be fun. Would you like some help? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the food, uh, there's going to be food there, you know that. There'll be casseroles up the wazoo, I'm sure, I hope. But uh, what I ask for is two things. I ask that there be at least 12 people that I'm talking to in the book group and that, uh, that they donate the, co the cost of a book, $25, to the birthing project so that I can gift Catherine for the work that she's doing to help support her work. And this is the pen that I got. If you if, if later you can, yeah, I got a picture of her pinning it on me the, the day we met, but if you want to look at it, that's, I really, if you, if you want to find out more about it, you just Google Birthing Project USA, and uh, so she's located in Santa Fe, but she'll, she'll be here soon to give a talk. Let's take some questions. and. John, if you could repeat the question because we're sure. filming this. And all questions are on the table because it, it, personal questions uh, about how to write, if you're interested in publishing, or about the book itself. So, yes. Have the rights to the book been sold to the filmmakers? We're, uh, they're in front of the producers and directors and studios now, so we'll see. To tell you the truth, and it's a sad commentary, there was a wonderful slate magazine article, which is Hollywood Loves a White Savior. And my commitment when I wrote this book to my friends that I would not have a good intention white person saving the day. That this would, that this he, I wanted to have a hero, I wanted to have a black hero that could be a hero not only to black folks, but to white folks. We don't have many of those in this society that all of us can surround. So I wanted Polly Shine to be somebody that white people could look up to. And it's a hard sell, to sell a book to Hollywood without a white hero. And what's interesting, that article, it goes through all of the Academy Award winners of these movies that dealt about race, and it, that's the theme. For example, you see The Blind Side? 
is, you know, this uh, Sandra Bullock just reached out and saved this poor, dumb college, this, this football. You know, you can't be dumb to play football, but they portrayed him that way so to make her be the savior. My favorite movie of all time, To Kill a Mockingbird. Gregory Peck is the savior in that. Tom, is, Tom who he saves, is this poor cripple. And then all the way up to the help. And then you have uh, uh, oh, Kevin Costner dances with, well, he was a better Indian than the Indians were. <laughs> so that's what we're dealing with now. We don't, they don't know if there's a market if they don't have that white hero to yeah. send out there. So another question. Did, did repeat the question. enable you to speak with such a wonderful woman's voice? Because I've never met a male or read a male writer that portrayed a woman's voice so brilliantly. The question is, um, basically, how did I speak with a convincing woman's voice? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I had no choice. What I, I, I like, like to work with kids, fifth graders, because that's the age they still have one, one foot still in the fantasy world and one foot going into where your commas go <laughs> and punctuation. <laughs> all the stuff that kills creativity because you have to think about how it looks rather than how it feels. And um, what they taught me is you take the voice that comes to you. That's the gift. You never question it. It is a gift when a voice comes to you. I tried to write books with male characters because I am a male. I thought that's the way you do it. And I'm, you know, I'm self-conscious enough at times being gay and what, what do people think about that? Does that mean he's, he's feminine in all ways? And so I wanted to write masculine characters, and they were boring. They just sat there like rocks. And uh, my first writing teacher, Mary Gardner, uh, read my first book, and she said, uh, well, I, I can't I read this, and I can't tell if you can write or not by reading it, but you got some good material. <laughs> okay, but she said, I tell you what, you got two women in here, kind of throwaway jokes. One is this Hazel woman, which was my mother. I just put her in there to get even with. She, she said, I love this woman. She said, you're not supposed to love her. You're supposed to hate her. She said, no, you don't understand. She's interesting. She's fascinating. How did she get to be the way she was? Drunk and, and a good dresser and drives Lincolns and turns it over in people's yards. She said, that's great. How did she get to be that way? You see, that's made. Well, I threw it. I had it made when I was... Most Southerners talk about with great emotion about the maids, their mammies, their right. I can't be racist because... Mammy just really loved, she was like one of the family. I always ask, what was Mammy's last name? Well, we didn't know what her last name was, but she was, you know, she's like a pet, is really. But I, I was lucky, I hated my maid, and she hated me. For, for, for a year, we just fought. I tried to get her fired, because I knew if I got her fired, my mama would come back home from work. I wasn't about being black, I just didn't want the stranger in the house taking my mama's place. So I threw this maid in and called her Vita Snow because I just love that name. I met somebody when I was selling books door to door named Vita Snow and I knew one day that was going to come back. So I named her Vita Snow. And she said, this maid, she's fascinating. She's sassy. It's the 1950s and she's her own woman. Isn't that rare in the 1950s to have a, a, a woman in a house being that controlling? How did she get to be that way? She says, back your story up. She says, let's see if you can really write or not. She says, back both these women up 20 years and tell me what their childhoods were like. And I wrote, and then the voices, it was like taking dictation. Oh. All my aunts came back, all those women in the grocery stores, those black women and those mothers, my mother's voice. It was like, wow, that was the background. That was a soundtrack of my life. Because I didn't pay attention to the men. The men were boring. They, they'd sit on the front porch at family reunions and talk about their V8 and their new truck or what, or what, the, or what the saints were doing at the, the uh, Where'd you get that car? Well, I got a good deal. Huh. They just grunted each other. <laughs> What's the pig market? What's the pork market? 20 cents a pound. Huh. Huh. And, and, and flip their cigarettes. Boring. You go to the kitchen and it, the it women... It sounds pretty interesting to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why you can write a man character. It was like, I go to the kitchen, here are my aunts and my mother and my grandmother sitting around with tears rolling down their cheeks with st telling stories on each other. And it's like there was like, you remember Granny when we were just kids and you and you were putting out the white the, the laundry. Remember that day, and you had those white sheets on the lawn. You boiled in the pot, and the, the boar pig got loose and it, ran, <laughs> and it ran between your legs. And you were holding that sheet, riding that pig, and it's like I'd heard that story at every family reunion, but it's always the first time because we were just right. laughing because what the women were saying: this is who we are as people. This is who we are. And so I was no fool. I hung out with the women. And in church, when the men were 
during sun, between Sunday school and, and preaching. There was that break where the men got to went out on the porch steps and smoked the cigarettes, talked about what little animal they shot over the weekend, and grunt, grunt, <laughs> grunt. But inside the women, there's women in the pews with these big, huge floral hats and the perfumes. I, heaven smells like this, I know. With these powders that older women used to wear. And, these, and they're leaning over the pews talking, and these hats are bobbing up and down. And they're telling the most unchristian stories that you've ever heard. I'd go in and I'd listen to the women. And they, you know, these women, these are voices you do not ignore and you do not put down. There's, there's fierceness to them. So I think all of my voices will be women. Men will pay, play supporting roles, but it's always a woman who takes over. And that's not by plan. That's just by grace. That's what hmm. God gave me to say. Hmm. Other question? question? Yeah, back here. Jonathan, what are you working on now? What am I working on now? I'm working on two things because I've been... I really enjoy, unlike a lot of authors, I was a speaker before I was a writer. So I really enjoy what we're doing right now. This is, I get a, I learn so much and I love people to ask me why I write because it's just like therapy for me. You ask, this is about who I am. I think about my mother and my father. I have memories that I, I get to re-remember my life in a different way, in a redemptive way. So I, and these stories come out, they're anecdotes, but also they have levels of meaning. So I want to capture those in a book. And not a typical memoir, but just how we save our lives through story. And I, as you notice, the, when I tell my story, the mo this is what I love about Faulkner. Faulkner I love because he explains my people to me. Mm -hmm. He explains my mama and my daddy. But I was blown away and a little upset when I went to uh, Roanoke, where his, his home, and there was a bus of Japanese tourists getting off. And I said, wait a minute, why are you here? Why are you? He said, Faulkner, oh, he knows Japan. <laughs> and there were Russians there. Oh, Faulkner has a soul of a Russian. He knows the steps and the aristocracy. And then what I understood was because he writes so specifically about sweat and about blood and about poverty and about cornbread and about mules, the more specific you get in your own story, the more universal it gets. The more universal you get, the less people can. So it's like. It's the specificity of the questions that I get from you that I get to go back and get my own sensory memories. Our memories are buried in our senses, not in our intellect. When I, I finally redeemed my relationship with my parents because I had just pushed them aside because I didn't want to be around these racists until I realized, oh, I am you. And also, you got some great material for my book. <laughs> so tell me of that funny saying you used to use, Mama. And uh, so, but we, if you... If, a little hint to you oral historians who are trying to get those stories from those elderly people who are not going to be around. You, the way to not to do it is sit a microphone up and say, okay, tell me about the Great Depression. <laughs> tell me about your life. They go right to their left brain and they tell you the facts and the data. And they feel like they've got to make it a certain way because this is the story. They don't want to hurt you. So it's just, if you want to sneak in the back door with anybody, ask them what they had for breakfast when, on the coldest morning of the year. Uh, what, what, did the, what, what, what did their mother's hand felt, felt like? What was the skin like? It's the sensory, and that, I learned this by accident because I grew up in the South white knuckling it through childhood because I was, as a gay kid, knowing that I was different, I was just always looking for the bullies. I wasn't looking for what color the trees were in the spring or how the hills rolled or what cotton looked like in the field. So my parents when I was 40 years old, 45 years old, after dragging through therapy, telling them they're bad parents, now saying, can you take me on a walk and just point out the, the trees and the flowers and tell me what you call them? Cape jasmine, oh, that's a really cool, that's what a gardenia is called. So, so through that, they, it didn't stop with Cape jasmine. She says, oh, Johnny, she said, Cape jasmine, when it come out in August and you'd be in the field, it would waft over. And no matter how hot it was, you were sweating and you'd had this dress on and, you, and it's like, that, and, and, and pulling that cotton sack, which made my shoulders hump and the, little, and the boys laugh at me. But the Cape jasmine would come, it was like, it was like I knew what heaven smelled like. It wasn't, it was their lives. The sensory moments are in our lives. So that's, um, that I, I want to write those stories that come up about that. And so I have three master narratives that I've been fighting with all my life. We're born into, Kierkegaard says we're not born into the world, we're thrown into the world because we're thrown into a universal, a universe that's it's already storied. And our job as a kids is to learn those stories. 
We have a family story, we have a religious story, we have a national story, all these narratives. Three narratives that I have had the most trouble with was being white. There's a white narrative. Even though it's stronger in the South, it exists here as well. It's just more insidious here. So I want to write about the struggle I've had with my white narrative about being a white man. The other is about being male. There's a, especially in the South, there's a strong narrative about how to be a male. And I spent a lot of my life trying to conform to that and robbing my, my, my soul of its real uniqueness. And then the third is about being, I was raised fundamentalist. So that ruined religion for me. So it's been a way of how to recover from that religion and not just reject it, but integrate spirituality back into my life to have a bigger life. So not, not have compartments anymore. Those are my compartments, being, being, a, being a gay man, being a, a white man, and being a religious man. And I want to write that in a way that it's integrative. So I'm calling it uh, growing up uh, gay fundamentalist and Southern Baptist in Mississippi or God, what were you thinking? So that's, I've got most of the stories there. It's just working with the structure. The third book is about, uh, I've got another novel. This would be a, like a trilogy. All these take place in the same area, Hopalachie County, Mississippi. And when I was signing books out in Atlanta, a man came up to me. I thought it was a white man. He came up to me and he looked at me and smiled and he said, hello. He says, you need to write my story. And he talked. There was an African-American dialect but what he said. And I looked up again. He said, I got you confused, don't I? I said, yeah, you do. And then I looked at his hair and it was more African-American, but it was blonde, but it had the texture. And his nose was typical what I would, you know, it's kind of a flatter nose. He said, you, you got me confused. I said, who are you? He said, you mean, what am I, right? And I said, yeah. He said, then he started laughing. He says, here's the book I wrote about myself. It's called Too White to be Black, Too Black to be White, a story of an African-American with albinism. Mm. And he says, I want you to write a book, but I don't want you to write it like most authors do. Don't use, we don't like the word albino, first of all. We have albinism. It's a condition. It's not who we are. And also, don't do it like, um, uh, what's Dan Brown's book? Don't make us evil. Don't make us magic. Don't rub our heads, all this kind of stuff. We're just people. We're just people. Make us people. And he says, we have an interesting sociology. And what I learned was African-Americans with albinism, born to dark families, they're lucky if they even survive. Mm. Their, their siblings, who look like both parents, are raised normally. But this white kid pops out. And no matter, the, the father can be 100% sure that's his child. But it's a white face looking back. And that brings back 400 years of shame about you can't protect your woman from a white man. And to take that child out in public and have all your friends mm -hmm. say, who, who got your woman, that those kids end up being pretty abused mm -hmm. and beaten. And I just found it fascinating. And also, what a wonderful metaphor about the craziness we have in this country around race. It's just the insanity around race and color. And his book talked about how he's treated it with his own people, supposedly black folks, mm -hmm. how they treat him, which is not very nice. How he's accepted, oftentimes, around white people until he opens his mouth, and so this, this place in between. And so it's my kind of book. It's about belonging. And I, I once heard that uh, authors, I was ashamed because all my books seemed to be about, all my stories seemed to be about the same thing. And I heard, you know, that's what writers do. They keep writing the same story over and over and over again because that's what, when they say write what you know, that's what it means. And so I know about the feeling of not belonging. And so I really want to write a book with this character. He's male. I don't know what I'll do about that. Yeah. He, may have to be, he may have to be female. Well, we'll see if his voice comes, but that's where I'll start. We are uh, almost out of time. So any of you that have to run, you're welcome to. But Just John, if it's OK can for we you, we can, can we take we one more? keep going. Sure. Been trying to get her yes, hand. I know yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is more mundane because I'm a, you know, aspiring writer. Sure. How much time do you It's hard to break out the research because I lived it for so long. It was, it was a spiritual journey, not so much I need to get these notes down. I was just having so much fun finding people and curious people. Civil rights work, I, I just wanted to go talk to them. I wanted to be in their presence. These 80-year-old men, the, the thing they did in their life was one day they walked behind Dr. King and it transformed. I just, these midwives, I just wanted to be around them because I felt healed. So it's hard to say the, the research is still going on. I still go to Mississippi just to go talk to people. That started in 1988, so I've got piles and piles and piles and reams. The midwifery research itself 
took a good three years, and that's ordering all these unknown books about child birthing history through America, and mm -hmm. and traditions in Sierra Leone. I, I wanted the I wanted the slave to trace her roots back to her own mother, so I had to study the slave birthing traditions in a little tribe in Sierra Leone called the Timney people. So that research was about three years, specifically about about birthing issues, how America's changes idea about women and birthing. Did y'all hear the question? I keep forgetting to repeat the question. Yeah. I think did, you did. did you hear what I was addressing? Yeah. Okay. And uh, Barbara, maybe this is the last one. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested, are, are your parents still living? Yes, my yeah. dad died in 2007, um, but he was around for the publication of the book, okay. and my mom's still living in Mississippi. I'm interested in the relationship with your mother and how she responds to reading your books right. and um, you know, finding, her, finding herself in the books. Um, and, and how your relationship has evolved. Sure. Um, writing the, the first draft of the book was, no matter what any writer tells you, especially when they start writing late in life like I did, 45, your first book is to get even with everybody that screwed over you. <laughs> <laughs> so my first book started out the, as a m morality play. I had good people and bad people. Bad people were my parents. <laughs> White people in general. And uh, the good people were black people long-suffering and of course and there was a victim <laughs> and the poor little kid who get beat up and didn't have a mother who was decent and worth crap so uh, I put everything my mother had ever done to me in the book I put her drunken episodes in the Lincoln which she drove I put she in the book she turns over the Lincoln in the sheriff's yard in, when, when, at, on Christmas Eve, just when, you know, we're sitting around waiting for Santa Claus, all the other kids are waiting for Santa Claus, we're waiting for our mother to show up in the, you know, what kind of shape. So um, I put that in the book, but I disguised it a little bit. In the book, she didn't turn the car over in the sheriff's yard, she turned the, you know, it, she actually turned it over in the mayor's yard. And dad was new in town, so she's ruined his reputation. So I put the drug abuse uh, going to Whitfield, and having her shock treatments and uh, the mental, I just put everything I could to embarrass her and humiliate her. So I took it home and as, as a first draft and showed it to my dad first. And my dad just turned white, just blanched after he read it. And he came into my bedroom where I was staying and he said, you cannot show your mother this. And I said, why not? It may be on Oprah one day and I don't want her to see the, you know, <laughs> sure. I don't want her, I, I, don't, I don't want to be so cold as her to find out about the book on TV. I want her to, oh God, I just wanted to get her. So uh, I gave it to her and so, and regretted it right away because my anger vanished and I'm back to be a, I'm a codependent six year old worried about hurting my mama. Mm -hmm. So she's reading this book and just, it, she's in the lazy, ba in the dad's lazy boy all weekend turning one page of the manuscript after the other, just no expression. We're all walking on. <laughs> Shells, dead's hiding the liquor, you know, <laughs> hiding the keys to the Lincoln, no matter. So um, toward the end of the book, she starts crying, you know, and then I'm just like I'm stabbed through the heart. I am just yes, I'm just I've hurt my mother, destroyed my. Regardless, my mother's the strongest person in the world, you know. Being pathetic is just a well honed act. She is, a, she survived some crap in her life, but I, you know, but no, I've broken her, and though toward the end, she puts it down. And of course, I got a master's degree in psychology, so I was, I was able to use that. I said, well, Mom, it looks like you're having feelings about that. <laughs> <laughs> so keep it way out there. And uh, she says, oh, I said, I said, how do you like it? She says, oh, Johnny. She says, I just love this book. <laughs> and I said, really? And she said, yeah. She said, just one thing, though. And I said, what, Mama? She said, the thing that makes me sad, she says, I just wish I could have been that little boy's mama. <laughs> and it's the brilliance of my mother's survival. It was total narcissism. <laughs> it was just like, whoop, right over her head. I'll, I heard that uh, Tennessee Williams, the, the role of Amanda in his book, uh, Glass Menagerie, that silly old woman, uh, his mother was backstage after the production, the first time she saw it, he said, Mama, how'd you like it? She says, I like it, except for that silly old woman you put in there. I just couldn't abide her. It was like there's no... And I realized, Mama, we didn't even grow up in the same family, did we? So um, it, that same week I was doing an interview on the local PBS station, and the interviewer asked me the question that you did. So I told that story, and my, I forgot my Mama was watching. So as soon as I got off the set, my cell phone was ringing. That's, that book was about me? 
<laughs> and I said, and I said, yeah, Mama. A lot of it came from my memories. And she, I said, you know, this may be a chat. Obviously, I remember things a lot differently than you do. Let's talk about that. And they just opened up this whole vein of conversation mm. to the point. Now she's in a she's in assisted living, and now when a new member comes in there, she takes them a copy of the book. She says, you got to read this. It's about me. <laughs> <laughs> Ethan, Ethan, and my, 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 my husband had read the book. And so I was taking him down to Mississippi for the first time. He says, I don't want to meet your mama. I know too much about her. I just know she says, I'm so afraid I'm going to call her Hazel. And so he walks in the door and he's scared he's going to offend her. So this, this, this elderly woman comes up, takes his hand and says, James, it's so nice to meet you. You can just call me Hazel. Wink, wink. <laughs> so she, Ethan, Ethan here, a really good friend and a fellow writer who has a really good book out called M O T H E R spells mother. Spells murder. Spells murder. Yeah, which is another loving mother book. <laughs> uh, went down, uh, went to the church where I was speaking. My mama was there, and he. She gave him, he gave her the book to sign. And how did I, she? I asked you first. He said, all right, if I ask her to sign, you said, well, just don't, have, don't say Hazel. Right. And, I go, and how did she sign it? Well, I, and she said, would you like it, Hazel? Or would you like it? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, whatever you like. And she she's, said, well, she's so. Signed, AKA Hazel. And she wants to be so liberal. She has this, she knows it's cool to be liberal. And she's not a liberal woman in her body, but it was like when I came out over the phone in 1981, I said, he said I was, I was, I was uh, gay, and she says, well, Johnny, I just want you to know, whatever, we love you unconditionally. She had just got through watching Oprah and, and, learned, and learned that word. And I said, well, and, I, and, and Daddy, of course, was telling the truth. He said, well, I wish that worked true. I just hate, I hate, the, I hate the role you're going to have to hold being gay in this world. I wish it wasn't true, and, and my mama said, oh, oh, Dale, she said, she said Johnny, don't pay any attention to him. See, we, you know, we, we learn things, we come along, we change our mind. She says, take <laughs> for instance. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, she's, that's, to her, I mean, to me, she may have never been the most perfect mother, I don't have to changed my mind about that, but she is a fascinating character. I have fallen in love with her as a character. I love being around her. I love writing down what she says, and I love learning what she had to get through to be who she is. To survive. To survive, and it says more power to you. So. We'll have to stop now. John, you're going to remain here, and yeah. uh, we'll be signing books, talking if you have other questions. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.